Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. We are here for the uh, monthly installment of our new law webinars. Uh, we've been doing these for a couple months now, and this one is about expungements. So if that is what you are hoping to hear about, that you are in the right place. We'll get started here in just a couple of minutes and just get, let folks, um, you know, get get into the whole system here. Uh, we have quite a few folks registered for today, so we will get started here pretty quick. Uh, but again, today, Homeline webinar on new laws, specifically about expungements. And thank you very much for joining us. All right, looks like things have slowed down um, somewhat in folks joining. So we'll go ahead and get ourselves started here. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. This session is being recorded, uh, so be aware. If you have questions and uh, everything like that, uh, go ahead and use the Q&A uh, sec section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We are going to be covering expungements today. We are being joined by uh, Homeline Policy Attorney Larry McDonough and Homeline Housing Attorney Steve Racky. So without further ado, just a couple of notes from me. My name is Rachel Sterling. I'm also a housing attorney here at Homeline, um, and I help host these webinars. Uh, if you are new here, uh, Homeline is a nonprofit. We help uh, tenants across the state of Minnesota kind of navigate what their rights are under Minnesota tenant landlord law. We've been around for a little over 31 years now and have helped over 310,000 uh, renters. So our, we offer our services for free and we offer it in four or four languages, English, Somali, Hmong, and Spanish, as well as an email option. And this is our contact information. Um, again, if you are a tenant in Minnesota, you can feel free to give us a call and we will do our best to assist you. Little cup, just a couple of housekeeping bits and pieces. Like I said, the session is being recorded and it's going to be available on our website in a few days. Um, the link will be shared on the website. This uh, PowerPoint is going to be including that as a PDF. So it will be um, available to you as part of that uh, test that recording. If you have questions again, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, don't put them in the chat. I will almost certainly miss them. I will feel badly about it afterwards, but I would much. It's much easier and more consistent for everyone just to use the Q&A function. That way, we can make sure that we're getting your questions covered. Um, we encourage any and all questions about uh, this topic, or if you've got a kind of general question about Minnesota tenant landlord law, we can try and address those as well. If you have something very specific for your situation, I would recommend just giving us a call instead. Uh, 1.5 CLE credits will be applied for after this session. Um, so if you're here for the CLE credits, uh, stick around and we will email you with that code as soon as we get it from the bar, folk. All right, uh, upcoming webinars. We still have some more left. There's, we've been doing these things since, uh, well, these particular new law webinars since June, and we still have a couple more to go. So uh, this one, like I said, is about expungements. Next month on December 20th, uh, we will have Larry McDonough, who you'll also see today, covering the public housing right to counsel and the eviction process, the changes to that in the new laws. And then coming up in January, we will be covering the new uh, renter's credit rules. So those ones um, are a little bit different in that a lot of the rules will start to take effect later down, like 2025 uh, timeframe. So that's why we're waiting until January to start covering those uh, changes. And exciting news, um, mark your calendars, December 7th, we are having a not quite, but almost all day CLE covering all of the new laws. It's going to be a more in-depth dive um, geared towards you know, attorneys specifically uh, um, about all of these new law changes. Um, so those 
are going to, again, December 7th. It is going to be from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. with a 30-minute break in the middle. So 5.5 standard CLE credits are being applied for for this. So that's a huge chunk. Um, registration is open. So if you go to homelinemn.org, you can find the links to register for that. It is going to be virtual over Zoom. Um, and we're going to have a lot of different folks and a lot of different topics covered. So everything from real in-depth dive in the eviction process to um, some more in-depth about expungements to heat and all of the things that we've been covering in these webinars, but in a much more um, technical uh, format so that if you are going to be needing to utilize all of these new rules as an attorney, um, that's really what the CLE is geared towards. So, oh, that was a lot. We got a lot coming up still as we're rounding out the end of the year, but Let's get back to today's topic, which is expungements. We are going to be joined first by uh, attorney, policy attorney Larry McDonough. Um, so Larry, uh, go ahead and take it away. Hey, can you hear me okay, Rachel? Okay, I'm... I can hear you, Larry. Yeah, we could hear you, Larry. And now Excellent. I can hear you again. Great. OK, so if you go to, go to the next slide, uh, my name is Larry McDonough. I have a lot of experience in this area. Uh, I've uh, been doing housing and consumer work, both in the legal aid world and the nonprofit world, going back to the mid 1980s. And um, um, probably from the period uh, up until the mid 2000s, probably, uh, or the mid 2000 teens, probably had done the most expungement motions in Minnesota. So let's get into the meat of this. Expungement, unfortunately, it's a word that uh, a lot of non attorneys don't know what it means, or they're gradually getting to know what it means. It means you have a court record, so it's not publicly available. So it doesn't require destruction of a court record. It simply means making it unavailable to the public. Now, I've gotten asked a lot over the years, well, isn't it just okay to take a name off of a caption of a case? Doesn't that do enough? And uh, I've been a real strong opponent of that practice because what it does is, so you have a court file and you can find that court file. Uh, anybody can do that by going to the court's records website and looking up either by name or by case number. And so you find that, um, that listing. And if the name comes off of it, that's good to a point because then if you go to that listing, you see A versus blank. Okay, so that's a good thing. But tenant screening agencies, which a lot of landlords use to obtain records on prospective tenants, are not required to change the caption on a case. They are required to expunge a case from their records. So if, a if the court file has a name change, um, the tenant screening agency may not be aware of that name change and may not have updated that name change. So their record may still show A versus B. While if there's an expungement and the tenant screening agency is notified of that expungement, and we'll talk about how to do that in a few minutes, then they have to take it out of the records. So I understand the appeal of doing a name change. It doesn't require much work, but I think it is of limited uh, benefit to the tenant. Now, expungement is available under both common law and under Minnesota statutes. And we'll talk about that first background on expungement so that we can tell you the significance of the new law that we believe will expand the availability of expungement. So first, let's talk about common law expungement. Before 1999, that was the only basis for expungement. And it was based on a, a number of decisions related to expunging criminal records. And so a number of us in the 90s were saying, well, those cases aren't limited to 
criminal expungement. So the court has inherent authority to um, seal its own records. Um, and in a minute, a uh, couple of minutes, I'll give you a link to a section of my eviction defense manual that goes through all this in detail. So um, now what we are finding in the 90s is um, some judges were not, and referees were not willing to connect enough dots to feel comfortable with this inherent authority or common law expungement. Um, and so uh, there was a desire to go to the legislature and have a statute that codified um, that ability to get an expungement. And we'll go into what that statute says in a few minutes and how that statute's being changed both this year and next year. Okay. Now, in 2014, there was a small change to 504B345. It kind of looks small on the surface, but I thought it was actually a big change, and I was involved with adding the language on this. So it, it's a statute related to uh, how courts uh, proceed through eviction cases, 504B345. And uh, there was uh, a sentence there that said the court may expunge records related to the action under the provisions of uh, 484014, which is the expungement statute. And I helped to add the following language, or under the court's inherent authority. And so I was hoping that inclusion of that language would make it clear that the court actually had that inherent authority and that it wasn't just something where, um, you know, we were just kind of trying to connect a lot of unrelated dots to support a proposition. So that was really a big deal in the history of the evolution of recognition of common law expungement. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of Court of Appeals decisions that have dealt with common law expungement. One is the at-home apartments case uh, from 2019. It's an unpublished decision, but I think it is still, and for those of you that uh, aren't attorneys or are not real up to speed on what's the impact of an unpublished decision, an unpublished decision is considered non-precedential and not binding on the district courts. Um, I wish we had a lot less or perhaps none, no unpublished decisions, but that is what we have. So the, the Court of Appeals can decide if it thinks a decision is of significance. And if so, they will call it published. If they think it may be of limited significance, they'll call it unpublished. It's disappointing that this one was unpublished because the Court of Appeals um, discussed um, in, in one in the concurring decision, the number of factors to be considered in um, in uh, granting expungement under the common law. Uh, next slide. So those factors listed by Judge Connolly. Judge Connolly was formerly a district court judge in Hennepin County, and he had heard a number of housing cases over the years. So he set out uh, what he viewed were a set of non-exclusive factors that courts should consider when considering a request for an expungement. Um, it didn't say these were the only ones, and it didn't say that they were ones that were um, more important than ones that might not be on the list. Okay, so um, there you see the list. It, it essentially, so with common law expungement, what the court's really weighing is, is the public really interested in this file remaining public? And is the, and does the tenant have kind of a strong kind of equitable interest in having this case expunged? So essentially a, a balancing test. And so what Judge Connolly was saying is, um, this is what I think you ought to be looking at. Now, keep in mind, this is a concurring opinion in an unpublished decision, so it's not binding. But district court judges take note of what appellate judges have to say. So I think this is a useful list. Now, there's another court decision just from 2023 that also discussed common law expungement, and that decision uh, was published, and it recognized that district courts have inherent authority to expunge. And that case is Housing and Redevelopment Authority of Duluth versus Young. And the citation is 995 Northwest 2nd 1 
It's a decision from July of this year. So there should be no doubt in anyone's mind that the district courts have this inherent authority this uh, in the common law to um, control their records, which includes the granting of expungement. Next slide, please. Now, before we had these decisions from the appellate courts, district courts had been granting expungements based on common law inherent authority for a long time and really going back to before uh, the, the, the statute was passed. And what um, and I've categorized those in several different silos, cases where the court decided that the case never should have been filed in the first place or the defendant was not at fault for anything the landlord was alleging, that there were un unique circumstances outside the defendant's control, there was a good faith dispute between the parties, or there was an agreement of the parties to settle the case. Um, and more recently, there have been a couple of decisions saying that if the eviction case could have been, okay, let me back up for a second. So there's a Minnesota District Court records retention schedule, and it has a schedule guiding the district courts on how long they should maintain files. And back in the old days, this was had more to do with storage space for physical files. Um, and so if you think that every court decision that's ever been issued by the district courts is still around, you are mistaken. Because courts have had this authority to physically destroy files for a long time. And the record retention guidance for most eviction cases is one year. So there, and now um, there may be a need to eliminate files to preserve stored space on computer systems. But regardless of that, there is this schedule and there have been some court decisions, uh, district court decisions saying that if a um, if a district court decision is old enough to be destroyed or removed under the file retention schedule, it's old enough to be expunged. And if you want to read more and look at these decisions, um, I've got a section on it in my manual called Residential Eviction Defense and Tenant Claims in Minnesota. Um, you can find that on the Poverty Law website that I maintain. Um, when you get a copy of the slideshow, if you simply hover over this link at the bottom of the slide, it'll take you to that section of the manual. Okay, so let's, next slide, please. Okay, so now let's talk about the statute. So 44014 was created in uh, 1999. It has some defin definitions here. So like the definition I gave you earlier of expungement comes out of that statute. Next slide, please. So the real meat of this statute are two categories. One, discretionary expungement. And there, uh, the court said the court may order expungement but only on the motion of a defendant. And if the court finds essentially three things, one, that the plaintiff's case is sufficiently without a basis in fact or law, which may include um, lack of jurisdiction over the case. So that's one. Two, that expungement is clearly in the interest of justice. And three, those interests aren't outweighed by the public's interest in knowing about the record. So what the statute did is essentially made it harder to get expungement but made expungement more, I would say, well-known. So under common law, inherent authority expungement, you really only have to do factors two and three, a balancing of the interest of the public and the interest of the tenant. I Now, when you're balancing those interests in the, in the eviction expungements, I actually think the public has no interest in evictions, but there's a segment of the public that does, and that's landlords. But what the statute added was this merit test. Now, I was able, when this was going through the legislature, to get the word sufficiently put into the statute, because I was a little worried that if the standard was that the plaintiff's case had no basis in fact or law, that there'd never be an expungement, because almost every case has some basis. The question is, does it have a sufficient basis or not? So that's discretionary expungement, and that's going to open up under the new law. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. 
Second category, mandatory expungement, was added in 2008 and amended in 2010. Um, right now, it's of limited value. Uh, you might guess from that time period that this change was added related to uh, the foreclosure crisis of the late 2000s. And so it added a couple of categories where the court had to expunge. And you can read that there. Um, I'd say it was a bigger deal in from the mid 2000s to maybe the early 2000 teens. Uh, a much smaller percentage of eviction cases now are um, would fit into this category. Okay, um, and then I have a site at the end of this slide for the actual statute, so you can take a look at it. Okay, so now in this next slide, um, most of the decisions really focused on this merit issue. Um, and that surprised me a little bit. With those three factors there, I thought there would be more analysis in the courts of what's the tenant's interest and what's the public's interest. And the court really, courts really all around the state really focused on the first factor, what's the relative merit of the landlord's case? And maybe maybe that makes sense. Maybe it was out of perception that if the case had limited merit, that the case uh, is better suited for expungement. Uh, and if the case had a lot of merit on the landlord's standpoint, that maybe it's less eligible for expungement. But um, the courts have focused on lots of different deficiencies in landlord cases, and I've got them listed here um, related to um, successful defenses by tenants on, on issues of service, preconditions, um, rent uh, claims, notice claims, and breach claims. And uh, I have a large discussion of these decisions um, at the link of my manual at the bottom of this, of this slide. Next slide, please. Um, now, in some courts, referees are more likely to handle expungements than district court judges. That's certainly the case in Hennepin County, in Ramsey County, it used to be the case, and more recently, uh, a judge has been assigned to do expungements. But whenever a referee is hearing and deciding an expungement, um, either party can appeal that. They can appeal to directly to the Court of Appeals, but uh, I think it often makes more sense to do uh, an intermediate appeal to a judge. Uh, and it's called a uh, request for judge review. And a number of denials of expungements um, have been reversed by judges uh, in this judge review process. And I have those decisions listed at this link. Next slide. Okay, so when you get an expungement, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to notify a tenant screening agency because the tenant screening agencies, my understanding is they take the position that they don't have an obligation to search the court's records and see if an expungement has happened. And so they keep records in their database until um, they are notified that a uh, an expungement has occurred. So when expungement happens, the court will remove it from the court's database, but the tenant still needs to send a copy to the tenant screening agencies those agencies are regulated by statutes in 504B.235 to 245, and I have a discussion of that in my manual as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have uh, a, a number of new statutes in landlord-tenant law this year. Most of them are going into effect on January 1, 2024. Uh, a small number went into effect this year, and I'm going to talk about one of those now. So there's a very large cannabis reform law. Uh, you've probably heard about that. Um, there were a couple sections related to landlords and tenants. One of them related to um, evictions under 504B171, the unlawful activity statute. But another one, and uh, we've already talked about that at an earlier seminar, and we'll talk about that a little bit at the seminar in December. Um, but what happened um, related to expungement is there's a mandatory category of expungement now. If the tenant um, 
if the case was commenced under 504B-171, which is the uh, unlawful activity statute, that's the statute that often was used to litigate cases related to the tenant's possession of drugs on the property, and a lot of those cases were related to uh, a cannabis uh, product drug on the property, most often marijuana cigarettes. Okay, so if a case was brought under 504B-171 or another claim of breach, and if the tenant could receive an automatic expungement under 609A.055, that's a, a criminal law expungement statute that has a number of details in it that I'm not going to go into right now, but you could go take a look at that statute and see what the categories are. Or if the breach was based solely on possession of marijuana or cannabis. Now, I don't think this is going to have a big effect because I don't think there were that many cases based solely on possession of marijuana that the tenant lost, but there's certainly some that are out there and the court has an obligation to expunge those. Um, I don't think the court is going to go back and search through its records to figure out which cases fall into that category. So it's going to fall on tenant advocates, I think, to um, raise that claim in a motion for expungement. Uh, there was no effective date listed for this change to the law, so it became effective on August 1, 2023. Next slide, please. So what's new in 2024 are, I think, a more significant set of changes. There are three different sections of um, session law, chapter 52. I've got a link to that at the top of the slide. And if you could just go down to article 19 and then search for section 117, you'll see a series of, of sections there that are related to expungement. So the first one was to essentially take the um, merit factor out of discretionary expungement. So now discretionary expungement under the statute, in my view, is going to be the same as it is under the common law. And so tenants are not going to have to show what the relative merit of the case is. Now, the tenants still may want to do that because that may help show why the public is not interested in knowing about it and why uh, the tenant um, um, should be getting an expungement. Next slide. So section 218, what it added to mandatory expungement, a number of categories, and this is this is also a big deal. I mean, what I just mentioned was a big deal, but this is also a big deal. Because as I mentioned early, earlier, mandatory expungement is really limited presently to a couple of categories that don't present that often. And the additions here are ones that present much more often than that. So mandatory expungement, if the defendant prevailed on the merits, if the case was dismissed for any reason, uh, if the parties agreed to an expungement, if three years have, uh, trans have gone by after an eviction was ordered, so let's say the tenant lost the case, but that case was three years ago, or if on the motion of, on the defendant, but the case was settled and the tenant had to fulfill some terms of that settlement and the tenant, in fact, um, fulfilled those terms. So only number six here requires a motion of the defendant. The other ones do not require a motion of the defendant and the court can do it on its own prerogative. Next slide. So also new for 2024, but unfortunately in my view invalidated was section 119, which made eviction records private until there was an outcome. It was based on laws and other states that have done that, but the Minnesota uh, Supreme Court invalidated that in August. I think it was really a, a separation of powers issue for the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court already has its rules of public access, and I, my read of it was that the court wasn't necessarily opposed to the concept of having evictions being a non-public until there was an outcome but wanted to be the entity that made that decision rather than the legislature making that. So stay tuned. Uh, I think there will be an effort to have uh, the rules of public access to records of the Minnesota Judicial, Judicial Branch amended to reflect what was intended in this legislation. 
Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to bow out and Steve's going to take it from here. But I'll be back to answer questions if needed. Yep. And uh, yeah, th if you, uh, speaking of questions, if you can put your questions in the Q&A, um, that's really helpful. I did see that there was a request for the link. Um, I am working on getting that. Um, it looks like the revisor may have actually updated the some of the um, uh, pages. So uh, my regular way of just grabbing that link is gone. Um, so I will get that link out and put it in the in the chat here in a minute. But I wanted to turn it over to Steve, who is going to be doing more of a deep dive into what um, doing an expungement actually looks like right now. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Larry, um, for uh, giving us kind of a theoretical and uh, statutory view of expungements. Now, the new law does not preclude motions to expunge. Um, and so all, I'm, all of what I'm going to talk about is still quite relevant. First of all, most tenants need evictions expunged before the six years go by or before the three years go by. Uh, tip, the typical tenant that calls us and asks for a an expungement motion for, for assistance, their, their eviction just happened. And they cannot wait three years to get it expunged. If it is expungible, they want it expunged much quicker than that. Rarely do I get a request for a motion to expunge where the case is over three years old. So the need for a motion to expunge still exists. Um, also, that slide that you that you just reviewed that Larry showed you about grounds for expungement, um, many of the specific grounds, like um, there was something wrong with the service or something like that, need to be pointed out to the court. There may be an eviction that has happened. Um, it may be dismissed, but someone has to inform the court that it is eligible for expungement and that may necessitate a motion to expunge. Um, the other thing, and, and I know I disagree mildly with Larry about this, but um, the legislature said that um, evictions need to be confidential while they're pending. Before it went into, before that provision went into effect, the Supreme Court decided it was unconstitutional. These are the court records. They belong to the court. And I question whether a piece of legislation that requires expungement after three years is going to be uh, followed by the court. And I, th I think there's a substantial chance that the court's going to invalidate that because they don't want the legislature telling the courts what to do with their records. They may amend their rules to conform with the statute, but that is the only authority that exists for dealing with the court records. So I'm just not sure that three years is going to work. Also, I don't know how to be implemented. I suppose there's a way to have an alarm bell for each case, but uh, there are some impl implement impl um, triggering issues. So um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, motions to expunge. And I have a template. Can you pull that up here? Yeah, Steve's you open that up. Okay, this is uh, what Homeline does when we're called is we don't necessarily represent the tenant in the expungement uh, proceedings, but we will draft a motion and send it to them. And this is 
a draft that I put together. Uh, the first thing, of course, uh, you need to um, complete the caption. Okay, scroll down a little bit and uh, keep scrolling. Um, now the first grounds is that the court that the uh, is statutory expungement, which is that um, the eviction has no basis in law in fact. Typical examples of that are the tenants moved before the hearing. And so there's no basis for an eviction. Um, there may be a problem with service. There could be all kinds of issues that attack the very basis for the eviction hearing. Now that ground is not used very often because uh, the, the uh, landlord's bar knows how to draft uh, a uh, complaint and uh, most of them are um, sufficiently based on law and fact. And in fact, the move out may occur after the eviction has actually been filed. Okay, go to the next page, please. All right, this is the one that's most most used. Uh, and Larry referred to that as the commonwealth or common law um, rationale. And uh, if the, and as Larry said, if there's any doubt about whether this exists, HRA of Duluth v. Young just decided um, a few months ago, uh, put that to rest. And in my template, I make reference to that a, a few times. Um, go ahead and scroll down a little bit. Um, and then stop. The uh, factors that are there are generally covered in uh, uh, Judge Connolly's um, decision that Larry covered and also in uh, HRA Duluth. And then the next paragraph, go ahead and scroll down, um, cites exactly what Larry put on a slide about what Judge Connolly um, referred to. Okay, next page. Okay, stop. Um, That paragraph um, also summarizes the common law or, or inherent authority uh, rationale for expungement. Now, I put that in the motion just to alert the court that uh, the you know that's the law, and um, HRA v. Young certainly um, amplified that. Okay, and then. There's a place where insert grounds. Okay, what goes there? Um, that's a narrative. Uh, let me give you a typical narrative. This is the tenant speaking. I am or was a tenant in uh, 111 First Street, um, Minneapolis. And on such such a date, the landlord filed an eviction against me on the basis of rent. On such and such a day, March 1, 2023, um, we reached a settlement. And I was required to make payments. Okay, that's all reflected from the court record. Okay, then let's go on. Um, I made those payments. I did everything I was required to do under the settlement. I was not evicted. I still live here. And I am current with my rent. Um, that's, that's basically uh, the argument for inherent authority. Um, now, sometimes things get a little bit more complicated, and I, and I'll well, I'll get to that later. Okay, I um, now you can go to the next slide, Rachel. I email that no next uh, slide. Yeah, next slide. Yep, okay, this one. So I email 
my motion to the tenant, and then I provide instructions. So click on the link, please. Uh, these are my instructions. Now, first I tell them to um, read very carefully whatever is underlined and make sure that it's correct. Paragraph two is kind of a template, which is the most typical expungement motions. It's in Hennepin County. And the landlord is stated, but the address of the landlord as stated in the court registry is care of Hanbury and Turner. My friends at Hanbury and Turner apparently don't want the landlord or the tenant to contact the landlord directly. And so the address that they provide is the office address of Hanbury and Turner. At any rate, what should be inserted in there in paragraph two is of course the correct court, it may not be Hannibal, and the correct address of the landlord, or if there's a care of the attorney, then that would be um, what they need to um, put down. And I tell them to get a mailing envelope with two stamps and address it to the landlord and bring that to the court when you file the motion. Then there's the fee waiver paragraph. And then generally what happens is the clerk, clerk gives the tenant two copies of the motion after it gets filed and two copies of a notice of administrative hearing. That's what they get in Hennepin County. In every other county, they get two copies of a notice of Zoom hearing. All right, I'm, I'm talking to the tenant. One copy is for you, tenant. The other copy is to mail to the landlord. And I tell him, go down to the basement and mail it. And then return to housing court. Tell them that you have mailed and fill out an affidavit of mailing. And so what I'm doing there is making this a one-stop operation so that the tenant doesn't just leave the courthouse, do the mailing in a few days, and then have to go back to the courthouse. And of course, so that paragraph is going to uh, differ depending on what county, uh, most counties have a, have a mailbox right in front of the courthouse. In Ramsey County, it's on 4th Street. So I tell them to mail the envelope right after they get their notice of Zoom or notice of administrative hearing. Then I tell them to go back to housing court and fill out an affidavit of mailing. And I warn them that if you do not mail the motion and notice to the landlord and do not file the affidavit of mailing, the court will not hear your motion. And that's, unfortunately, even though they get that instruction, that sometimes happens. Um, and the, the court's gonna insist that the landlord be notified it is not sufficient. Um, you know, the court may e-file a notice of the hearing and the attorney for the landlord may get it, but that's not going to be enough to provide valid notice. There has to be this mailing and an affidavit of mailing. And then I tell them in Hennepin County, I say, that's all you have to do. On the date and the notice, the court, the judge will review the court file, make a decision, and mail you the court's order. In every other county, I say, um, appear at the Zoom hearing. So that's kind of the procedure. And it is a little complicated. And there's nothing in the new law, new law that changed the procedure with respect to um, how to file a motion to expunge. <clears throat> okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, these are the easy cases. Um, the eviction has no basis in law or fact. That's, that's the first grounds, the statutory grounds. Again, typical cases where there's no basis in law and fact is the landlord 
filed the mo the uh, eviction action, but the tenant had already moved out. Or um, the landlord properly filed the the um, eviction action, but between then and the time of the hearing, the landlord moved out or the tenant moved out. So there's no basis for an eviction because the tenant has in effect self-evicted. Now, I tell them, if you're gonna do that, or if you've done it, make sure that that move out was well-documented. How do you do that? Well, you move out, you tell the landlord you've moved out, you make arrangements for the key, and when you moved out, you got rid of all your stuff. If you didn't get rid of all your stuff, let the landlord know that whatever I left, I'm I'm abandoning it. The move out has to be um, complete and formalized and documented uh, in order to give rise to an expungement on the basis of that there is no basis in law or fact. And if a tenant has simply packed a suitcase and moved out um, and all their stuff is still there because they, you know, maybe they're going to come back and they didn't return the key, that's not a move out. All right, another typical, actually more typical um, case is where the landlord dismissed the eviction action either before or at the hearing. And the reason landlords dismiss it is simply because the tenant paid and the tenant's balance is now zero. Um, unfortunately for the tenant, what landlords typically do is they contact the court in writing and maybe even a phone call saying, uh, I want to dismiss this, strike this from the calendar. And that occurs. The problem is, of course, the eviction is still there. It has not been expunged. And even if the tenant shows up at the hearing and says, hey, I um, this was dismissed, so but it's still on my record. Could you please expunge it? They'll be told by the court, you're not on the agenda. You can't show up and get this erased from your record. You have to make a motion to expunge. Um, I have told tenants, um, if the landlord offers to dismiss it, ask the landlord not to do it. And you go to the hearing, landlord doesn't have to be there. And you uh, tell them that it's paid, the landlord's dismissed it, the landlord's not even here. And so I ask for a dismissal and an expungement. And you'll probably get it. But um, as I said, most of the dismissals that occur do not expunge. Now, in this particular instance, the court's legislation may be of help because the court has dismissed it. You know, a letter to the court saying this is dismissed doesn't really do the dismissal. The court is the only has to make the dismissal. And perhaps the new legislation will give the courts the hint that if the landlord dismisses, don't just dismiss it, expunge it. Okay, another easy case is the tenant wins. Um, that doesn't happen very often. You, you know, when, when I say win, wins at trial. Um, as part of its order, finding in favor of the tenant, the court should expunge as well, but um, sometimes they haven't done that. And, and, you know, maybe the statute will encourage courts to, to do that. But the most common easy case is this. Everybody shows up for the hearing. There's a settlement conference and a written settlement or a stipulation or whatever you wanna call it is filed with the court that requires the tenant to make specific payments at a specific time. And the tenant makes all the payments. Now the problem is, how does the court know that? The court doesn't know that. The last entry 
in a case like that in the register is going to be the order in which the court adopts the settlement. There is no document that must be filed and generally there is no document that is used to tell the court, hey, the settlement is completed. It's been followed. So, and five years ago, if that was the case, a motion to expunge would be denied because the court would say, well, was this a righteous eviction action when it was filed? And if the answer to that is yes, the fact that the case was settled and the fact that the tenant did exactly what they were supposed to do would not get you an expungement. What has happened since then is the courts, as a matter of policy, have granted expungements in those cases. Um, there may be some outstate counties where the judges haven't gotten a memo, but that is uniformly followed in uh, Hennepin, Ramsey, and in other metropolitan counties. But keep in mind that in order to get an expungement in that type of case, somebody's got to tell the court what happened. And that could be done with a motion to expunge, or it may be accomplished by the landlord filing an affidavit of compliance stating that the um, tenant has complied with all of the conditions of the settlement and that both sides, both the landlord and the tenant request ex immediate expungement. Um, that, that doesn't always happen, even when it's in the settlement. Uh, sometimes a month goes by and there's been no, you know, that everything's been paid and uh, the landlord hasn't gotten around to it to um, filing that affidavit of compliance. And so something must be done. So what I do is I prepare a motion to expunge, but I start out with referencing the settlement that the landlord said they would file an affidavit of compliance and they haven't done it. So therefore, um, judge, please consider this to be an affidavit of compliance filed by the tenant, which would justify immediate expungement without the necessity of a hearing. And I, I haven't seen that done, but uh, hopefully it would be done. Um, I think sometimes it's just easier for the clerk to set it up for a hearing. Um, and what do I say? You know, I, I mentioned it before, but I, I say in that that the so there was a settlement, tenant did everything they were supposed to do, balance is zero, tenant still lives there, no eviction. I don't try to answer the questions of what is this in the interest of justice or any of those things, even though, or you know, outweighing anything. I just lay out the facts. The fact is that this is taken care of. And generally the courts uh, will expunge in those cases. Okay, next slide. Here are the harder cases. Um, a typical harder case is where actually an eviction occurred, or at least the court ordered eviction. But sometime after that, before there was the eviction, and sometimes it, you know, there'll be a week before the sheriff shows up, um, the tenant makes the payment. And the landlord doesn't follow through. The landlord either doesn't get a writ, or if the landlord has delivered the writ, the landlord will tell the sheriff, never mind. And that's a good outcome for the tenant. The problem is that the bare record says there's some, that the judge ordered eviction. That's a problem. So in that case, um, I think you have to do more than say, I, I made all the payments because in fact you didn't you didn't make any of the payments maybe but you had you made the payments later and I think in that case you need proof um you know proof of a check proof of something proof of a ledger indicating that the payment was made and that should be attached to the motion to expunge 
Um, because it's not, otherwise, how does the court know that? Um, sometimes, and I, you know, maybe the eviction happened six months ago, and maybe the tenant owes $5,000 to the landlord. Okay, in order to get the expungement, um, or at least be certain of getting the expungement, the landlord's got to be paid. I, I tell the tenant, get $2,000 in cash. Go to the landlord and say, Mr. Landlord, I'm holding in my hand $2,000 in cash. I'll give it to you right now if you give me a note saying that, that, that my balance is now zero, I owe nothing, and um, that I don't oppose an expungement. Okay, the, the landlord's not getting full payment, but I suspect that many landlords never expected the tenant to walk in months later with $2,000 in cash. They've probably given up on it. So I think in that sort of case, uh, even though full payment is made, as long as the landlord accepts the fact that this is full settlement, uh, you've got a situation for expungement. Okay, next case. Um, these are the hardest cases. Um, defendant owes rent and hasn't been able to pay. That's a tough case. Um, because assuming that it's a righteous eviction in every other respect, then um, the court will want to know what's the situation. Is rent still owed? Now, the statute would say after three years, who cares? But again, um, I guess I'm just not counting on that statute being applied as written. Uh, another one is evicted for bad conduct, um, fighting with other tenants. Um, that's going to be a tough case. I've gotten these expungements um, on those grounds, but only because the tenant was uh, experiencing a mental illness issue. And we were able to establish that by uh, medical records. Um, other than that, um, if, you, if you've been a really bad tenant and been evicted on those grounds, your chances of expungement are pretty low. And uh, and then if the defendant, if the landlord objects, I have probably done over a hundred eviction or expungement motions. And I could count on one hand the amount of times that the landlord has objected. They don't show up for the hearing. Even though they've been notified, they do not attend. And, and that's great for the tenant because then the motion to expunge is um, not opposed. Uh, but if they do, and if they got a good basis, that, that could be a hard case. All right, next slide. Um, here's some things to every expungement motion, this should be added. And that is the tenants, you know, we've already talked about you know, what happened to the eviction, was the rent paid and all that. Always add this though, the, the tenant's individual situation. Have, has the tenant been turned down? Has the tenant gave up because they keep being turned down? Have they been homeless? And homeless includes couch hopping, hopping I, you know, they're, they're homeless, living with family or living with friends. Or living in cars. Uh, do they have minor children for which they are responsible for housing? And I just put in the ages of the children. I don't name them, but I, but I, you know, attendant has three children ages 10, 7, and 3, and is responsible for their housing. And any other factors that um, demonstrate difficulty in getting housing. Uh, that should always be added to any any case. All right, let's talk about settlement. Next slide. 
let's say that the case is being settled. Now, landlord, of course, is going to want all of the um, all of the financial terms in the settlement. And I tell the tenants, okay, once that's been decided, then address in the settlement issues of expungement. And there's basically two ways that this could go. Um, option A, plan A is the best one, that upon payment, the landlord will file an affidavit of compliance and a request for immediate expungement. Or you could say that the landlord and the tenant or the tenant may do that filing. Remember that the landlord is going to get written notice that an expungement motion is pending. So the court, if they get an affidavit from the landlord's attorney, then the court can be satisfied, well satisfied that the payment's been made. If they get it from the tenant, um, you know, in Hennepin County, where that is the only, there is no hearing, um, particularly, um, I think the, uh, it, it, if the tenant is filing the affidavit of compliance, I would advise that that be part of also a motion to expunge. Now, if plan A doesn't work and the landlord, a typical reason for it not working is the landlord doesn't want to pay the attorney the um, fee that involves drafting and filing this motion. Um, an alternative is that upon payment, landlord will not oppose the tenant's motion to expunge. So when a case is being settled, those things should be addressed in the settlement and put down in writing. Um, the first plan A, if it works out, could, could be an immediate expungement and no necessity of filing a motion. Uh, plan B, if that's what you've got, then you're going to have to file a motion. Okay, next slide. The hearing. The hearing is usually 45 to 60 days out to, and the reason for that is to uh, make sure the tenant or make sure the landlord gets notice and that the motion, the affidavit of mailing is filed. Uh, well, but well before the hearing, um, generally it's a Zoom hearing. The first thing the court will look at is: is an affidavit of mailing been filed by the tenant? Um, if it isn't, that's a problem, and the court probably will not hear the motion and may dismiss it entirely. And it's a Zoom hearing in eighty-six counties, but in Hennepin County, it is not. Instead, in Hennepin County. The court does not issue a notice of a Zoom hearing, but issues a notice of administrative hearing in which the court will read the um, motion and anything else of record and make a decision without the necessity of a hearing. Um, I, I generally tell clients that, uh, that uh, allow two months for this to be resolved from the beginning, from the very beginning of getting the motion and filing it till the time that the expungement actually occurs. Um, and so that, that may be important information to let the tenant know <clears throat> because they may have a lease running out or they, you know, they understand that while this motion is pending, they can't be looking for housing because they're not gonna get it. So um, that's important to make sure the tenant's aware of that. Okay, next slide. Um, there's a number of things that I want verified and I I, I keep track of these things. I, I check up on it. Did the landlord, uh, did the, uh, um, if the landlord agreed to file an affidavit of compliance, did they? And sometimes they don't, even though they said they would, they just don't. Uh, is the eviction still on record? So what I do is I tell the tenants, okay, two weeks after you have done everything you're supposed to do and your balance is zero, call home line and we'll check it out to make sure. And, and what you want to see is when you put in the file number, it says no cases match this file number. That means it's gone. Um, if it pops up and there's the case, um, something's wrong. 
Um, there are instances in which the court has ordered expungement and a month later, it still hasn't been expunged. And I, I tell the tenant, go down to the district, go down to the courthouse, go to the window and say, why hasn't this been expunged? And the, the clerk, I mean, they miss it. They miss it. They don't read the order or something. It just, the, the clerk's office actually erases it. And, and so another reason to verify that uh, you've accomplished what you, what you wanted to do. Okay, next slide, and actually last slide, the screener. Um, I don't know, I, I, I disagree mildly with um, Larry on this. Um, there are all kinds of screeners. They change, a screener goes out of business. It, you know, sometimes you have screeners from out of state. Um, there's no way that you can write a letter to all of the screeners, you know, how many screeners are out there? You know, there may be a dozen, there's at least five or six. So I don't, and in my experience, when it, when something has been expunged, I very rarely get a call from a tenant saying, hey, I got expunged, but my, evic but my landlord evic or declined because it was still on my record. And then I look and I see it's, it's not on a record. It actually did, did get expunged. So in that case, the tenant can usually solve this problem by um, getting finding out from the from the landlord uh, who was the screener. Um, I would hope that when a screener gets a request from a landlord, that before they look in what they've get, you know extracted from farming, that it's that the first thing they do is look up the file. Because that tells you if it's a, if it isn't there, it isn't there. And in my view, any any screener that doesn't do that and instead relies on their data farm uh, is violating the Fair Credit Act. Because I think the screener owes has a responsibility under the Fair Credit Act, which requires them to provide accurate information that that they search the database to find out if the case is public. And uh, and I think most of them do because they don't they don't want to get in trouble with uh, with anybody. So that's my um, advice on uh, how to pursue an ex a um, motion to expunge and I'll send it back to Rachel for questions. All right. Thank you so much, Steve. And um, obviously we have lots of um, you know, even amongst ourselves, a uh, difference of interpretation and opinion. So obviously these things are, they're in the future, yet to be seen how this actually all plays out. Um, some of the new laws, we've said that before in other sessions, and it's going to continue to be true is we'll see how the future, what the future holds a lot of, uh, one thing I wanted to make sure folks knew about. Um, so Steve was sharing his um forms, but the court also has their own forms. And I did link them here um, at the, with the court's website um, so that, because these are the forms that are available in the court's website. And these are essentially the same forms, um, but a slightly, you know, Steve has tweaked his slightly for his own personal use when he's helping out, but um, you don't need home line to file an expungement. Um, you know, you can do it on your own if you're a tenant um, or if you're another attorney and you just need to help someone out with this, you know, going through an expungement clinic or something like that. There are forms available just through the court's website as well that you can print. And I think some of them are fillable as well. And they come with their own set of instructions to how to fill out those particular forms. So those are also available as well. Um, um, Rachel, if I could just interject. Where, where tenants have filed their own motions, they really concentrate on my situation. I'm homeless and so on. And don't always identify the sure. status of the action. And that's, you know, both those components are important. It's important yep. that the court know that the tenant is, having, is in distress, but it's also important to know what happened during the eviction. Absolutely. I is more of a, uh, the other point I was going to make as well, Steve, is that, um, you know, we can help folks kind of fill out these forms or help 
with that, but we some not everyone here at Homeland can do that. And frankly, we just don't have that kind of capacity to do it for everybody. Um, so it's something that is some can be done as well if you're an attorney or you know if you are a, you know willing to take a go at it your own self. Um, we do have several questions that have been coming through. So um, I'm going to start with some of the pre-submitted questions quick. We have about 20 minutes left of our time today. So I think we'll be able to get through most of these fairly quickly. Um, so I'm going to be kind of bouncing back and forth between the two of you. Um, I may referee if we get into a heated discussion over interpretations and things. I may uh, jump in and say uh, the classic, it depends, and we can move on. Um, but let's go ahead and start with, um, so. Just, I just want to jump in for a second and say, yeah. I think Steve and, and my differences are really quite small in the scheme yeah. of things. Absolutely. And you get two lawyers in a room and you're going to get three answers to a problem. So like, that's usually how that works, right? At least. <laughs> right. So, um, you know. No, nothing abnormal here, um, but I wanted to go in through some of the pre-submitted questions quick, um, and then we can move into the questions that have come in through the Q&A. Again, please use that Q&A function um, just so that I can, it, it's easier for me to manage the questions that are coming in. Um, so first, we'll just go in order. Um, I did send some of these to Steve and Larry ahead of time, so they had a little bit of time to, to percolate in their brains. Um, but Jessica, who I believe is an attorney, um, they asked um, after the Supreme, Supreme Court order that uh, basically that you touched on that said that certain uh, the evictions are not going to be made confidential while the case is pending. Are there other ways forward? Uh, they're asking for making pending evictions on public. Well, I think they can. I mean, a, a judge has the discretion to make a certain case confidential. Um, what the court, I believe, is saying is um, you can't tell us, the keeper of the records, that when someone files a public motion or action to, to eviction, that that becomes secret. You can't do that. And, and you know, so it's, it, it really goes back to what the practice was before, which is... Um, you can always ask for it, and some courts might find a reason to grant it. Well, I think an option is to uh, propose an amendment to the rules of public access to records to miss or judicial branch. So that's a whole set of rules. A lot of people don't know about those rules. Uh, I've advocated for changes in those in the past. Uh, you do a proposal, it goes to an advisory committee. The advisory committee makes a recommendation to the Supreme Court. And then anybody can request an oral argument or make comments to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has a hearing on it, makes a decision. And some of the changes that were made, I can't remember what it was, maybe 2016 or 17, uh, were on requests that uh, were made by me and also Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid that the Supreme Court adopted. So that would be the forum at this point if the Supreme Court uh, can be persuaded to look at this differently. There are other areas of law where records are kept within certain parameters. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, Rafido, who I believe is a service provider, um, asked how far back can things be expunged? Forever, um, forever. <laughs> Although keep in mind that the, you know, if it's on record um, and it's 10 years old, and a screener is asked to make a report to the landlord, the screener cannot report that eviction that occurred more than seven years ago because of the Federal Fair Credit Act. Now, that doesn't stop a landlord <clears throat> from accessing the court records, finding that eviction, and using that as a basis to deny. Uh, when a screener says, no records of eviction. Everyone knows, including the landlords, that they're, what they really say is within the last seven years. Yep. And if you ever find that a screener is reporting an eviction uh, that's older than that, um, 
you should talk to an attorney about it because I'm not confident about compliance in the industry. All right. Uh, so basically, Julian is asking a question that you have already uh, essentially answered, uh, both of you. Uh, they were just asking about, can a tenant ask the court to remove the eviction if they paid up rent and are still living in the apartment? Absolutely. It's what the Essentially, the whole process that Steve went through was about. Um, Susie is asking about forms available that we can do this ourselves. Those are the forms that I was talking about from the court. Um, those are the, or uh, Larry has some on his website um, that he linked to as well um, that are available. Um, I'm assuming that those forms are going to be updated come January 1st with the new information. Same with the court forms that are on the court's website. So there are forms available that you can use. Yeah, I've communicated to uh, the courts about the need to update a number of different forms uh, beyond expungements. Um, things like eviction complaints, eviction summons, answers, and expungement uh, motions, and uh, and then uh, I'll be updating mine as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one thing I, I want to mm -hmm. add is that the the one one reason why I first developed my form and Steve's form is substantially based on mine is the court's form did not discuss common law inherent authority expungement. And with the merit test in the current law being there, there were a lot of cases that weren't not going to get expunged on the statute, but maybe would get extend, expunged under the common law. And so I think it's, and I, I always use the common law as a backup. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think there's a strong case for statutory expungement, but I'm gonna assert it under the common law as well, because if the judge disagrees with me on the merit test, then maybe I still get the expungement of the common law. I think that distinction may be less significant once we get into 2024 and the merit test falls out of the statute. Uh, but that's why I've been, um, that's why I created my farm in the first place is I thought the court's farm had a big hole in it. Yep. And again, like a lot of these things, it's, to be seen what happens with the new law and how they're implemented and what the courts do with everything come 2024. But what we can say is like, this is what it's gonna say. And you know, the forms and things will be adjusted as needed. Um, Nancy is a tenant and is has an interesting question about wondering if you can file for damages if an eviction was not legally done. Does anyone wanna tackle that one real quick? I, I don't know. You you probably could. We wouldn't help you at home line, but uh, there may be some damages. And uh, um, I, I, if some caller on home line were to ask me about that, um, I would discuss what they feel they they how they've been damaged and uh, steer them to a private attorney. I think it's theoretically possible, but. Uh... You have to be able to isolate what was the error and who committed the error, and then what was the effect on the tenant of the error. And um, and so it's certainly possible. I'm not aware of there being cases in Minnesota that have led to like some sort of large judgment of damages like you would have like in a personal injury case or something like that. So I'm, I'm not... I'm not real optimistic about that being kind of a viable claim, um, but I think it's theoretically possible. You know, one possibility is uh, the client has money, they have a good income. So when they make the motion to expunge, they have to pay $300. And if the action should never have been filed, um, an argument might exist that, uh, uh, they have a claim for the three hundred dollar filing fee, and they could file that in conciliation court. Oh, it's all very theoretical, but yeah, that's an interesting question, right? Um, Jackie has a question about um, what is the process for non leaseholders in the household? Can they have an eviction on their record? So, what is the process of you know, if someone's not in the lease but they're listed on the eviction? Well, if the eviction goes through, well, actually, whether or not the eviction goes through, if they're named as def if they're named as a defendant, they have an eviction on their record. Mm -hmm. um, 
even if it's erroneous. And they need to do something to get this eviction off the record. So what if they were, say, a tenant, um, and but weren't necessarily on the lease itself? Um, you know, is that, should only leaseholders be listed on the eviction captions no. when things are filed, or are there rules around that? An eviction can be filed against any occupant. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they don't have to be on the lease to be a proper defendant in a uh, eviction action. Now, generally, landlords don't. Uh, list minor children, and I think that's a good thing that they don't do that. Um, and if a minor child were listed in an eviction case, um, I think they would even have a stronger case for expungement, uh, depending on the circumstances, but assuming that the child's done nothing wrong and it was um, the conduct of a parent that did something, then the, the child would have, I think, a really strong argument for common law expungement. But under the new statute, getting rid of the merit test, they'd have that as well. Um, yeah, but I agree with Steve. Uh, anybody who is an occupant um, can be listed. Yeah, a child, you know, if they're only, um, if they're under 18, I don't think they should be a defendant. And I think that's a clear basis for an expungement. Um, and then uh, Nico is just uh, to reiterate, uh, what are the limitations of years on background checks? Well, I, I don't know what screeners do. Um, and I don't know, if, you know, the limits would be in the Fair Credit Act. And and I, I'm not sure whether the Fair, federal Fair Credit Act limits inquiries. I'm certain it, it it has limitations on disclosures, and that's the that's the point. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to hop over now to the questions that have come in during the session. Um, we can talk through those. We've got about seven minutes left, so I want to make sure we touch on some of these. Um, Marlene is asking: Is there a statute of limitations for asking for an expungement? No. Yep, that is. One of the nice things you can ask for it 15 years from now if you really need to probably don't want need to but you could and the other thing related to that is the older the eviction is the more likely it's going to be expunged even without the new law because um you know the the, the probative value to whether a tenant is going to be a good tenant to a sp prospective landlord based on something that happened 15 years ago is pretty low yeah and it's also you know even if it's six years old and still can be listed. I I always put in there that this eviction will have its seventh birthday on X date. And thereafter, a screener will not be allowed to report it to a prospective landlord. So that that's a you know, and that's a, a good argument for expungement. If the if the eviction happened six months ago, that's the tenants um better have some good reasons. All right. Um, so then, um, let's see here. Can you go over the difference? I Marlena is asking another question. They're asking about what's the exact difference between asking for an expungement and actual destruction of the file. Um, I think maybe there's some confusion here. Can you go over the difference between maybe what confidentiality is versus expungement? Well, I, I don't, files are destroyed as a matter of administrative process. Um, it has nothing to do with expungement. Uh, a, a, an expunged record is not destroyed. It's sealed. Yeah, and I talked a little bit earlier about the file retention schedule, and that is not, um, it's not mandatory. It's just guidance that courts can destroy uh, files after a certain period of time. And the guidance for most eviction cases is one year. Uh, I've, I've never run into a court, a district court that has destroyed uh, files on one year and one day. Um, and there's there's probably less file destruction happening, physical file destruction happening because there's less physical files. I mean, it's all, almost all PDFs. Now, when the court system, I agree with Steve, when the court system expunges a file, 
they are not necessarily going back and deleting the file. They're simply putting a screen on it so that it's not publicly available upside. When uh, when I was a young person, if I got evicted or was disorderly someplace, my court record is in, if it exists, is in the basement of some courthouse or someplace. And I didn't need to have anything expunged. And then somebody invented the computer. So here we are. It's true. Things are a lot more accessible now than they used to be. So that's part of why updates are needed, right? Well, that's also what gave rise to it. I mean, I've been practicing since the mid 80s. And in the old days for a tenant screening agency, they would a person go to the courthouse in Little Falls for Mille Lacs County and go through a register and look through the files and maybe get a photocopy of a register and then go back and manually put it into some sort of database. So tenant screening as an industry really only took off when it was able to acquire files digitally from the court system. And that's what really gave rise to having an expungement statute. I mean, we didn't have one to the late 90s. And what happens right now is the larger tenant screening agencies, they have a subscription with the court system and they have a digital download that happens, I think it's like every Sunday, and then they populate their system with that. And so I agree with Steve, it was really that um, kind of technological change that allowed tenant screening agencies to be uh, a viable business model, because in my view, and this is my personal view, um, they're based on um, kind of getting the most data for the least amount of effort. Yeah. Actually, that goes right into Lindsay's question. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but can you go over again? Um, if the a case has been expunged, um, but it's still populating on a screening record when a prospective landlord does a background check, uh, what can the prospective tenant do in the situation? Well, I, I think if some if the court administration hasn't gotten around to following the judge's order, I, I, I tell the uh, tenant to march right down to the courthouse and talk to the clerk. When that happens, they get expunged very quickly. If you talk nicely to the clerk, right? Well, Be polite. But the other problem is if the tenant screening agency has not learned that the case was expunged. I mean, I agree with Steve that what they ought to do is check the court's database. I have no information to make me think they are checking the court's database. So that's why on, on, on my webpage, I put a link in the chat. I have a form letter that goes out to all the tenant screening agencies about which I know. And I agree with Steve, the smaller ones kind of come and go. And they're not really, they're probably not the big problem. It's the larger ones uh, and they're, you know, but if they get a copy of the expungement order, then they have to take it out of their database. And if they don't take it out of their database, um, they're going to get into some trouble. I mean, they could get sued for violations of both the state law and, uh, and the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Yeah, and I'm actually going to put in the chat here, uh, there is uh, uh, someone here from, it looks like Housing Justice Center, and they've got a, a program as well that they're running uh, for Take Back the Record that they might be able to help out with as well. So I just posted that in the chat. Um, let's see here. All right, so we are at three o'clock. Are you two able to stick around for another couple minutes to go through these remaining sure. questions? I'm good for about five minutes, then I have to go to another okay. meeting. Well, then I will ask you the most complicated question. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, there's two questions here, actually, for you, I think, Larry. Um, does the removal of a requiring a defendant's motion for mandatory expungements mean that tenants can request expungements without needing to file a formal motion and come and pay the accompanying motion fees? Uh, yeah, so a motion is a request, and uh, there's nothing magic about calling it a motion. It is a request of the court, and if you file a written request for the court to do something, whether you call it a motion or not, you're probably going to get hit with a filing fee. The whole purpose of this law not having that uh, uh, requirement of the tenant making a motion is that the court will hopefully do some of these more automatically, like it dismisses the case and it just expunges it. 
tenant wins the case. It just expunges it. The parties settle. It just expunges it. And because there have been some courts that have said, you know, we're pretty busy right now, so you're going to have to come back and file a motion. And now, now the statute hopefully is going to encourage the courts to just do the expungement and not and not go down that road. Gotcha. And then similarly, I'm going to scroll back really quick to one of your slides, Larry, or because the question is why on number six, uh, upon motion of a defendant, if the case is settled and the defendant fulfills the terms of the settlement, why does it require a motion? It's a similar question. Um, but do you have any additional insight into why that particular one requires? Well, I think the, the challenge there is how's the court going to know if the terms have been met unless somebody tells the court that the terms have been met. The other categories there don't really require anybody to tell the court anything. Um, well, the party, I mean, the party settled a case that they've settled it, but then the court knows about that. So I think that's the reason with number six is the court would not know about it. Uh, whether the terms have been satisfied unless someone tells the court that. Awesome. All right. Um, I think that is it for very Larry specific questions. Most of the rest of these are, are going to be about, um, so the last question I guess for both of you is, uh, to confirm from James, any evictions older than three years should be expunged via mandatory expungement uh, starting next year, right? <laughs> well, the short answer is right. <laughs> the question is, what's the mechanism going to be? Yeah. Um, and is and and I agree with Steve. There might be pushback from the court saying, "Hey, this is kind of getting into the weeds of our business. We'll do the best we can." Um, I think. Um, you know, if I had an eviction that was older than three years, I would not wait for the court to do it on its own. I would do it with my own motion. Uh, and hopefully at some point, there'll be some sort of automatic thing that goes into place. But I'm just not uh, optimistic that on January 2nd, uh, there's going to be a big evaporation of uh, three-year and older cases from the debt, from the court's database. I mean... Ideally, that's what happens, but we don't know. And we haven't had any indication from the courts yet about how they're going to handle it. So, well, thank you very much, Larry. I appreciate the time. Um, take care. Um, so, Steve, real quick for you, if you want to, um, is the tenant required to have a third party serve the notice by mail in an expungement? No. Um, the uh, tenant... Um does the mailing and it, it, it's just a regular first you know i, I don't, don't send anything certified just put a stamp on it and mail it and then go to the court and fill out an affidavit stating that you mailed it and that's that's all that's required yeah all right and then So then um, from start to finish, how long does it take to take for an expungement to go through? Well, um, the court schedules a hearing and then the court wants to give the tenant an opportunity to do the mailing and file the affidavit. And uh, in, in Hennepin, it's generally been about 60 days out, which is, of course, more time than needed, but that's what they do. And uh, then once the either the Zoom hearing occurs or the administrative review occurs, I would say in Hennepin, a decision comes out within a week. So, and and also in Ramsey, I think you know the judges technically have sixty days. So it's like any other motion you make, um, and if the court says. I'm going to expunge this eviction. That doesn't expunge it. Um, a court, the court has to file a written order, and a clerk in the in the court administration has to do the physical, you know, the physical thing that expunges it. Mm -hmm. And that could take a while, or maybe the next day. Gotcha. 
All right. There is no time period for appeal, though. The criminal expungement, every decision has stayed for 60 days. Fortunately, <laughs> Steve, that, yeah. that is not uh, the case in eviction expungements. Let's not even open the term criminal expungements into this. Let's not sure. bring that into so confusion. It could, yeah, the court could, uh, it could be expunged the next day. But that's something the tenant needs to know. And that's another reason I follow up because you don't want them, you know, if, if the court takes two weeks to get around to implementing the court's order, and, and the court has taken two weeks to get out an order, um, the uh, tenant may want to look for for housing and and really should not until the eviction is no longer of record. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, the eviction or expungements are a process of the courts, not of the landlords. And um, Wendy has a really good thing. I just am going to say this. It's not really a question, but um, notes that if the judgment was for costs and disbursements, but the landlord never filed an application for taxation of costs, then there's some language that can be used about um, uh, the basically stating that the landlord didn't file the appropriate paperwork to get that. So no money judgment yeah, that, was ever entered. That's correct. Now, if the case is settled, mm -hmm. the landlord more, you know, most of the time is going to make that part of the price of settlement. Sure. So that, if the case is never settled and the eviction occurs, um, that fourth ground, which talks about time, um, is relevant, you know? Yep. Okay. If, um, if the case is, the judgment appears in the eviction, record in the eviction number so if the eviction is expunged the judgment vanishes as yeah. well yeah uh and sam just says thank you uh it's this instruction she was very helpful for them they're a housing stability advocate so um, I'm going to go ahead and um, if you have other questions about specifically what we do at Homeline, uh, I would highly recommend going to go take a look at our website, homelinemn.org. Uh, there's a lot of different resources there and information about what, who we are and what we do. Um, and so thank you all for coming, for staying a couple minutes late. Uh, thank you, Steve, for coming. Uh, again, this recording will be up shortly on our website. And uh, we look forward to seeing hopefully a lot of you next month at our eviction process, uh, as well as if you are an attorney looking for CLE credits, our big all day CLE is next month as well on the 7th. So take care all and have a wonderful rest of your day now. Bye bye.